that's it, folks. So we can uh, make a start. Um, Happy New Year, as well can we welcome you all to 2019 for our first committee meeting of uh, the calendar year. Hope everyone had a very good festive period and a, a suitable break uh, accordingly. Um, obviously, as per the, the notes, there's a few bits of housekeeping uh, that I'll mention. Just first and foremost, if people's mobile phones can be turned to silent, please, so we don't get any uh, disturbances, be those rings or kind of different musical or vocal interruptions, depending <coughs> on your intent. Um, obviously, if I can encourage everyone to use the microphone appropriately and speak close to it so everyone uh, using the PA system can hear accordingly. Um, we're not expecting a fire alarm, so if we do have one today, uh, if we do treat it as live and listen intently to the very polite lady uh, whose commentary is part of the fire alarm system and will direct us accordingly, but if we do need to have a full evacuation, the assembly point is just outside uh, the Museum of Liverpool. Um, in terms of filming and photography, we very much welcome and encourage um, that, uh, but we are conscious of the fact that certain mobile devices can um, sometimes cause a bit of interference with the PA system, so we always request, wherever possible, anyone that is wishing to, to film or record, if they could uh, speak to our officers uh, at Democratic Services accordingly so we can make sure everything's accommodated correctly. Okay then, um, obviously uh, a couple of announcements and I've already wished everyone the best for, for 2019 and looking forward to the, the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Um, we're obviously uh, welcoming uh, a new member formally, so if I can sort of put on record our very warm welcome to Councillor Doc Johnson from Nosley, who's joining us for our first official meeting of the Transport Committee. Wonderful to have you on board, Dot, and we're really looking forward to working with you the weeks and months and years ahead. First item proper is apologies for absence, and uh, have we received any of those, Charles? Not sure, there are no apologies for this particular meeting. Uh, Sue? Chair, would I give apologies, please, for Councillor Keith Roberts, and can I also give apologies for. Councillor Jackson, thank you. That's excellent. And, and I was just going to mention uh, Councillor McKinley had been held up in traffic, but he's just with us uh, accordingly. The second item is obviously declarations of interest, and that's just the standard for me to remind anyone if there's anything that now they are aware of or at any stage during the discussions and debates that they have a declaration to make, then please make sure you do so. Steve? Chair, only as a matter of course, for the minutes the petition I presented at the last meeting, so we play that interest again. Excellent, lovely. Thanks for that, Steve. Which leads us nicely on to uh, item three, which is the minutes of the last uh, meeting. Can I move that those are a correct record of the proceedings on the 13th of December, if that's agreed? Agreed. Excellent. Okay, I shall uh, add my autograph to, to those, and those become a matter of public record. Um, the fourth item is developing a mail transport plan, and I believe you is going to be presenting this one for us. So, here, and it's here. Thank you, Chair. Um, hope you can hear me okay. Happy New Year to you and to, to all members. I'll, I'll quickly take, take comments to the report and have to pick up any questions at the end. Uh, the brief aim of the report is to seek endorsement of the committee for the approach that set out in this report for producing a non statutory mail transport plan uh, and perhaps draft indicative timescales there for members' consideration as well. I'll explain why it's non statutory in just a moment. Uh, but just by way of context from section three, uh, an action in the mayor's or in the command authority corporate plan for the coming year, for two years to be strictly accurate, is amongst a number of significant activities to produce a mail transport plan that encapsulates our transport vision and delivery plans for transport. Now, local transport plans themselves are statutory requirements, so every transport authority in the country, of which the combined authority is the transport authority of the local city region, is obliged to produce and maintain local transport plans. We have two for the city region at present, that were produced in 2011 and predate the combined authority. We have two because we used to have two transport authorities, first side was one, Bolt was the other, so we have two plans. So that makes it inherently complicated as a starting point for 
articulating a vision. What we've also done as well, as members will, uh, will recall, is produce a very significant number of important daughter strategies uh, along, the, along the years. So you know, ferries, there's a tunnel strategy in development, we have a rail strategy, a bus strategy, uh, a ferry strategy, and so forth. All of these have been produced for very good reasons, but again, it adds to the, to the number of transport policy documents that we have. Although the transport plans, the statutory transport plans are now getting on a little, picking up to eight years old, the message that's contained within them is still actually very, very current and very relevant. The plans talk about a new mobility culture, it talks about growing transport in a different way that reduces its impact on the environment, that provides accessibility to people, uh, that decouples growth from car emissions and deal with air quality. All these issues, in my view, are as relevant today as they were when we produced these plans back in 2011. So, in essence, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with those transport plans. The proposal, which is taken from section 4 of the report, is to effectively try to bring all of this together and update it in the immediate term. Uh, we have those two now, we have those two statutory transport plans, we have a large number of thematic plans that are covered and also listed in the appendix to the report. And really, we see this as an important opportunity to try to simplify the transport message. So, when it comes to lobbying, when it comes to articulating our vision, making bids, commissioning activities using our strategic investment fund or our transport and cities fund, we're much clearer and much simpler for our colleagues and members of the public to, to understand what our transport vision is about, whether it's high speed to Northern Powerhouse Rail, ticketing, walking or cycling, freight, road safety, whatever, to simplify those messages. And that's what we're proposing here, is a short, non-statutory mayoral transport plan. It wouldn't formally replace the two local transport plans. The reasons are twofold. One is that producing a local transport plan takes quite a long time because there's a, a statutory process associated with it, and we probably time ourselves out. The other really important reason is because it would be out of step with work that is now underway on our local industrial strategy for the city region. That is effectively our inclusive economic growth plan for the coming years that sets out our broad, will set out our and the Bears' broad vision for sustainable growth across the city region. That will have a big bear on transport, transport demand. So our view is it's better to await that piece of work before we start on a new statutory transport plan. Otherwise there's a risk that transport and wider economic growth objectives are out of step, and that's not what we're about to take by authority. 4.6, uh, members are content with that approach. <coughs> Sets up predictive timescales, fairly short, sharp piece of work, um, because it's not standard, we can do this fairly quickly. The intention is to, uh, to develop the plan in the coming weeks uh, and bring a draft document back to the Transport Committee in April, um, followed by a sign-up by the Combined Authority in, in uh, later on in April, on the 12th of April. Um, so it's writing the report, we're having some advice back legally that there may be some issues here with PERDA which we'll need to factor in, but those are the time scales that we're very much working to. Uh, and that's the other proposal in a nutshell, Chair, to produce a, a non statutory federal transport plan to simplify and articulate our transport vision for the foreseeable years. Lovely, thanks for that, Hugh. Have we got any questions or comments that Paul wants to raise? Thank you, Chair. I think it's a, a good document. On page 11 of the recommendations, item C, notes that the Chair of the Transport Committee of Metro Mayor will receive regular briefings on development and contents of the Mayoral Transport Plan. I should like to see also read that the Chair of the Transport Committee will provide relevant regular briefings for members of the Transport Committee. Yeah, which I think makes ultimate sense and really we should have that to begin with. Excellent. Are we all comfortable with that? I think that makes a lot of practical sense. And before we sort of move on, I'm just going to say if we haven't got further contributions, I think it's a really good step in the right direction. What if we think about... Um, oh, John, sorry. No, no, you go first, mate. Thanks, Joe, very briefly. Um, just, I, I realise this is an overall plan, um, but there's, there's not a great deal of detail about sort of climate change reduction strategy. There is some uh, a reference to it within the document. Um, I'm just wondering when we come to draw the actual detail plans, whether it would be much more specific detail for us to consider when, it, when you bring it back to us on the 4th of April. Would that be the case? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Absolutely. The aim is to draw together all of the, the evidence, the new 
levels we've got around climate change. You know, there's an example, um, the Metro Bears Manifesto commits to people their zero carbon. The Paul City Region by 2040 seems to include that's a core consideration that we need to address right in front of the transport plan. Yeah, no, I'm equal. I was just going to sort of conclude by saying, um, I think it's a really good and positive step in the right direction. When we think about what London has achieved with their mayoral transport plans and the kind of vision and delivery that we've seen since, well, certainly the candidates that first took the morality and others now followed, um, it shows that the power that these kind of documents potentially can have. I think the way we're going about it is a really practical way. Uh, we've got two really good statutory local transport plans that still have uh, almost a decade to run on them, which do cost money to sort of produce from new. So actually, let's pull something together, which is a really good overarching approach. Now, before we then move on to the next mayoral transport plan, which is likely to be uh, based on statutory local transport plans. Obviously, um, I think with the development of the mayoral transport plan, those will need to be reviewed with each morality, but that makes ultimate sense anyway. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the development of this document, and then frankly, cracking on with some quite vision and delivery that I think we've already got a good track record on, but this has the ability to take it even further. So if we're all sort of happy with that, if I can move, including that um, amendment from Sue and Steve, uh, if we can move the recommendation to paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. Item five is the Merseyside Road Safety Partnership and the Liverpool City Region Road Safety Strategy for 2017 through to 2020. And we've got Sean and Hayley from Nosley who are here to present this report for us. So welcome and over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks for providing the opportunity um, to update members on progress made by the Merseyside Road Safety Partnership. This is a casualty reduction um, in the columns of the Liverpool City Region Road Safety Strategy 2017 to 2020. By way of background, in July 2017, the Command Health Authority approved the strategy. Um, to set out a challenging long term vision to reduce the number of those killed and seriously injured on the city region's roads. And that was to fewer than 400 by the year 2020, with the ultimate vision of a future where no one is killed on those same roads and the injury rate is actually reduced. The strategy was endorsed by the Police Commissioner and Metro Mayor. And it's a note that the PCC added road safety to a, uh, a priority in the police and crime plan. Working in partnership to improve road safety um, was a fifth priority. In terms of just to note that the Bolton Wood Council is, is actually aligned to the Cheshire Road Safety Group. Um, we do cross attend each other's meetings to ensure there's a synergy approach and ensure learning to maximise benefits. In terms of progress on the vision to date, um, in 2016, prior to adoption of the strategy, um, there were 599 people killed or seriously injured on the road to Merseyside. It is of note that this has risen significantly from 511 in 2010. Following adoption of the strategy, the KSI has reduced to 557 in the calendar year of 2017. A reduction of approximately 17 bed, approximately 7 percent. In terms of national comparison, Merseyside from 21st of 42 police force areas. So therefore Merseyside represents the median rate of overall case size national. Preliminary data for 2018, and this is only January to August, but there's a sort of a lag between the occurrence of collisions and recording. Um, Indicates that there is a continued reduction in 2018. Um, it's projected that there's a 13% reduction from 2017 figures by the end of 2018. It's therefore considered evident that the activities undertaken by the partnership are supporting a reduction in the number of people killed and seriously injured on those roads, at least from the 2016 baseline. However, to achieve 400 a reduction to all in the by 2020. A further reduction of approximately 18% is required over the next two calendar years. This clearly remains a challenging vision, but significant progress has been made, and it is considered that the vision remains achievable. 
This is testament to the ongoing commitment to all partners to make our roles a safer environment for everyone and contributing contribute to the success of the growth of the publicity region. However, we're not complacent to every death or serious injury on our roles if you want to be many. Our continued vision must be for zero loss of life on those side roads. The road safety strategy for achieving safer roads uses various methods and measures. It targets road safety interventions in the most cost effective and cohesive whole. Partnership work and collaboration is both okay to our approach. The activities that we've conducted in accordance with the strategy generally are generally grouped under the traditional road safety, three years of education and support in terms of hearing. The report may be our supplement by innovation, monitoring and evaluation. <coughs> Targeted work, as set out in paragraph 5.3 of the report, looks at four specific groups of road users that have been identified as if they are of concern. They are adult pedestrians, those are between 26 and 59, pedal cyclists, motorcyclists, and senior road users, aged over 60. However, we do not exclude any activity in other areas, particularly not the theme in reducing the number of child pedestrian casualties from to private city. The advantage of this report, which Rebecca will, will provide a presentation on, provides details of the action plan um, and the activities that the department has undertaken over the last couple of years. It is important that the partnership does welcome all contributions to the road safety agenda. It's extremely important that we listen to all views of any constructive comments that are provided to the, to the partnership. And in 2018, we positively engaged with campaign groups, academics, and we heavy change agencies. We've also supported activities of charge support organisations for all customers and things such as road In terms of the financial matters for the Port Safety Partnership, there are no financial implications in that the, the partnership operates with a reserve um, to get the capital efficiencies which is derived from important cost recovery and diversion costs. In terms of equality and diversity implications for the road safety strategy, because we're seeking to make roads a safer environment for everybody, the strategy has a positive equality and diversity implications for all of the protected characteristics. However, right, those implications are formally documented on case by case basis for each intervention, scheme, or project that is undertaken, pursuant to the road safety strategy. From a communications perspective, in 2018, a full branding exercise has been facilitated on the Disney website scheduled for development in early 2019. These efforts will maximise ongoing communication engagements and activities, pursuant to quality reduction. In conclusion, show that the partnership is striving to make our roles a safer environment for everybody. Significant progress has been made following adoption of the strategy. Fresh evidence-led approach through partners means that the vision remains achievable. Again, this is testament to ongoing commitment to all partners, but again, noting that every death or serious injury in our roles is one too many, and ultimately it must be our continued vision for the disease of all support. I just have the opportunity for Rebecca just to, to run through some action plan. Council has lead 
the honest thematic area. Um, points to so on up, go ahead and decide to place them in, in, in the city region. Um, I set them a challenge to reduce the number of pedestrians who have killed us in the development roads. It's a team of psychologists, strategists, behavioral practitioners, and communications in collaboration with road safety analysis. It's a particular problem early to, to educate and reach. One of the initiatives that's been derived from the work undertaken by SOMO is to <coughs> advocate a goals on the crossing facility initiative on, on a couple of trial sites in the city. Um, one of them is going to be outside the town hall at the end of Castle Street, Stale Street. Um, and that's looking to positively identify the control crossing facility and could reduce what we found is the lower pedestrian walking away from the control crossing facility. Um, <coughs> Being hazardous, the second location that's currently considered in Preston probably not as well. Uh, as well, which is a bit into violent um, or similar, similar mindsets in terms of it's a gold standard experience, obviously, it's going to be highly visual, um, sort of proof of things going for transport, for the additions, the equipment. Um, the target cohort is all pedestrians in hospital areas. Uh, there's a methodology of physical installation traffic that's going to be and the word is But there's a, some of the psychological measures as well as in, in terms of rewarding behaviour, so the crossings will have extended green time for the as well. Um, I'm subject to these trial sites working positively as an option to roll results for other sites in the city. Next slide.
which hold about 30 to 40 people per course. They're looking at class one drivers and um, it's delivered in two modules. The one module is a theory module, so this is giving you all safety information as um, a, a HDB driver, what you'll be looking out for for the cyclist. But then they also um, have a practical session where they actually go out as a cyclist, so they can see the cyclist's point of view as well. Uh, so uh, when they go back at, um, and drive professionally, they'll be able to have a better understanding of cyclists on the road uh, to keep them safer. Uh, what we've uh, supplied watch out cyclist stickers, so uh, and they've been distributed. There's bikeability training uh, being rolled out for level three cycle training. Um, various cycle events. And also, we've now um, commissioned Kaleidoscope, which is a near-miss website. So any cyclists that feel uh, that they have had a near-miss, they can put this into uh, the Kaleidoscope website, where the local authorities can collate that information to see, was it a near-miss, is there any uh, intervention needed, is it um, any uh, more education needed? So it's just more information we've got we can produce um, on our next section plan, it could be, it could, it could develop that in a different way. Okay, so with also within the cyclist, we've done brand campaigns by Close Pass. So this is where the um, <coughs> services have gone out cycling and they've had the cameras on them and if somebody is passed too close but they think it's dangerous, then they'll be pulled over. They're offered to either to um, take the traffic offence report for um, the events <coughs> or they're offered some education there and then. And this, they um, go to the map, which you can see the police officers on there, and they can show uh, the driver exactly how they should be passing the cyclists to make it safer. We've also extended this close pass to horse riders as well. Uh, the other campaigns we've been looking at um, is our Look Again campaign, and that's um, aimed at cyclists, but also uh, cyclists to um, make themselves more visible, but also for cars to keep looking to see if you can't see a cyclist. And that's um, gone out on bus backs and also social media. Senior road user events have been um, delivered uh, around the five local authorities. And within those um, events, they have had a play uh, which highlights uh, the issues that they may face and any educational interventions that they can use to make themselves safer. Um, the, um, they've also received at these events car seat training. So um, it's been identified through these events that quite a lot of senior road users do actually look after our children and they um, don't know what kind of car seats they should be looking at. So uh, we've uh, trained road safety officers up and to be able to give them advice. I'm also having a look at what happens now. So those senior road users that are looking to give up their license can get all the information of how they can use public transport. We also offer our Drive Safely for Longer scheme, and uh, this is a two hour free driving lesson for those over 60. Um, this will give uh, the senior road users a uh, chance to go out in their own car with a qualified driving instructor, and they can look at the new road layouts, any new laws that go in, but if they've got any routes that they generally take that they want um, the driving instructor to see them drive, they can do that. And this uh, just gives them the skills to be able to continue driving, but safely. To date, we've, given out, uh, we've um, administered 2,366 of those lessons. Our child pedestrians, um, we have a theatre production going out to year nines, and that, that's been delivered in Nosley, Sefton, St. Helens, uh, we're all have got some booked in for um, <coughs> January and Liverpool will uh, be receiving the play within uh, January as well. And feedback from this is a word he just claimed that it's the best paid school that's ever had. Young Driver Engage. Um, so this is linking in with driving instructors, um, the 
Jill, uh, the, the, the young driver, that will be taking lessons, but also if parents or family members are given um, lessons, it um, just links them all together to give them um, the best safety advice of when they're actually uh, taking their lessons, so they can, um, when they do actually pass that, they'll have a better understanding. Communication um, and it, it incorporates our innovation as well. So our communication, um, we've recently rebranded, so hopefully you'll see our name um, when you're out and about. But it, we've also um, got a Twitter feed going and also um, a Facebook, uh, which we will hope to expand on our social media as well. We're developing a new website at the moment as well, so any messages that we like, they can link back to the website. And uh, within our innovations, we're looking at um, virtual reality. So any engagement events that uh, the partnership do support, we can come out with some um, virtual reality uh, equipment so whoever we're engaging with can see a certain uh, place or, well, a reality of that situation that they're looking at. So whether it's young riders, motorcyclists, or uh, senior road users. We've also got sat safe going in as well. So that can we can look at um, how senior road users are driving before they go on one of our drive safely for long schemes and then afterwards to see if it is making an impact and if we do need to make any tweaks or changes. Okay, so we've got the enforcement element um, of our up updates, and uh, we have Operation Lamella. So Operation Lamella is led by the police, and um, they target uh, dangerous behaviours, um, considering the KSIs, where, where they are within which local authority. Um, to date, they've done 2,200 traffic offence reports. Uh, they've recently done Operation Nem uh, Nemesis as well, which is the drink and drive focus that was going through December. So that was roadside checks. Um, they'd stop people and uh, test them for drink and drive. And they've also got um, taxi operations. Um, so they're looking at taxi drivers to see um, if, if they uh, are over the limit or if they are under the influence of drugs. Um, so far, there's 54 of them. Um, so this is a mid-year um, update. So there was 54 um, taxi drivers up to the mid-year, but to date it's been 80. And lastly, we would be looking at engineering. So improving safety through road engineering forms a significant part of the success achieved so far in reducing casualties, is introducing physical improvements to road layouts, lighting, geometry, signing and signal control, junction improvement and car features have all played part in reducing risk and casualties. Thank you. That's yeah, so, so in conclusion, we and then the final question of the contents of the reports we actually got to be just right. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sean. we will be back for that. I think that's really, really useful. I'm sure it stimulates lots of different thoughts and ideas and perspectives. So we've got Gordon, then John, and Tony, and Helen. Hi there. Could I just take you back to the slide that was uh, given to us? And we have the smart crossing with the, the crazy thing. What I struggle with to try and believe it, and I've mentioned this before, but you see the traffic signals there, and below that we've got the box that gives the indicators across the road. That's facing each other like that. I think that's the right way, but everywhere they go, you've got these on the side now, haven't you? So you know when the lights change, you're in the middle of the road and you can't see what, whether something should be coming. These are the same people that probably put in the, uh, the orange lights, you know, some point in time on the streets and they said it was better for us. So, the question is, is who's, 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 uh, who's looked at the design of these, uh, the crossings themselves in, in terms of how, how 
out of the way. And also it's the, the length of time that it's given for people that are, have got protected characteristics uh, to be able to get across the road in, in due in fair time because I think uh, some of them need to be sprinters in the Olympics to get across. So the question is, why have you got it side facing? And the speed of the change in light so. Thank you, Chair. Um, one side. In terms of the distinction historically you've had um, public crossings, which are about five sides, green, red, man, you think so. And there was a challenge to the initiative of public crossings, which have got near sided, red and green, man. The, the, the principle behind that is that you look in at the green man up in front of you and you can see the traffic approaching it. As well, we're supposed to look over the far side and not know what the vehicle's doing. So, the principle of um, in 2016, when the new traffic sound regulations were introduced, um, you're not permitted to install pelicans anymore. Um, the other advantage of puffing crossings is that you have overhead detection. So, if you still stop the side of the crossing with the puffing, the crossing knows you where it is and where you stand at the time across the signals. If you press the button, manage to walk across between vehicles. The overhead detection realizes no pedestrian there, so it walks off the signals for the driver. So, since 2016, by exception, you still can provide the far side. You can't call them to hurt pelicans. You can, if there's a case by case basis, you can still provide the far side. I think green map the principle is the near side one to say. I wouldn't want to put that to the test on the strand outside this building, Chair. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just touching on the second point as well. That's one of the initiatives here in terms of the length of time that the use of the cross the facility have got across the road. These gold standard crossings, these two trial sites, we are going to extend that time and understand what the impacts are going to be on the vehicle flows in the middle. That's one of the, the, the optimum elements. Just out of interest, Sean, what type of bird is that one named after? Is it an albatross or an eagle? Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Open to suggestion, <coughs> I'm not up to something novel. Okay. Answers on the postcard, then. Um, John. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for us. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I represent uh, Halton on this particular committee, along with my two excellent colleagues here. And uh, I'm just wondering, um, Paris, I'll give you news. Halton is currently excluded from the first part of the Merseyside Road Safety Partnership meeting. It's currently at the moment. I'm just wondering what the reasons are for that, because you said in your presentation you were open to new ideas and so on. So I'm sort of concerned that we've been excluded from the first part of the meeting. Is there any reason for that, please? And if that could be overturned, we'd be extremely grateful. Thank you. So you, Chair, in terms of Halton, do attend or will attend the partnership? Sometimes we're asleep, we're now standing about on the Cheshire one as well. So it is, it is purely a matter of the police force, the police force and it is the, the enforcement and the income that's generated um, from those efficiencies are separated. So that's what ought to benefit from the Cheshire Police Authority work and the rest of the city region and the most So does that mean that the meeting is actually split into the two halves? Is that what you're suggesting? Because it just seems like, because one of our officers actually <coughs> asked me to raise this, and just wondering what the reasons are. You, you obviously highlighted the reason. But is there really any need for that? Because they're not being engaged in that process? I think, well, yeah, I think you're right. More recently we have, so we, we've looked at that issue. So there is some independence on each other's meetings now. Um, so all that are included in the activities. Um, that we perform and can learn the lessons from the methods that we're going to take it. There's just not physically funded from the Mersey side of the whole partnership. Any assets that are holding on the same funded by the session will take it. But we are invited. There isn't two separate meetings. But we don't exclude the whole time parts of the meeting. So that means they can attend the first part of the meeting? I think they're welcome to attend. I much appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Superintendent. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Sean. The 